Chapter Twelve of the Seven Sleuths Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Seven Sleuths Club by Carol Norton. Chapter Twelve: A Sleigh Ride Party. Promptly at two, Geraldine and Alfred, well bundled in furs, were waiting in the hall when a joyous shouting, ringing of bells, and blowing of horns announced that the merry sleigh ride party was coming up the drive. Alfred threw open the door and gave an answering halloo. Then, turning, he assisted Geraldine down the icy steps. I wonder where Danny O'Neill is, the Colonel exclaimed. I told him to put ashes on the icy places, but he has not done so. The girls graciously welcomed Geraldine and made room for her on the deep blanket-covered straw between Doris and Mary. "'This is for you to blow upon,' the former maiden said, producing from her coat-pocket a small tasselled horn. For one moment Geraldine hesitated. Then, as the two big white horses raced along the snowy roads with bells jingling, she soon caught the spirit of merriment and found herself tooting upon a horn as gaily as the rest of them. Never before had she had such a jolly time, and she was actually feeling a bit sorry for the city girls who had never been on a straw ride. The sun was bright, and, long before they reached their destination, they could see the ice glistening on Little Bear Lake. As they drew up at the inn, to rest the horses a moment before turning up the seldom-travelled East Lake Road, Mr. Wiggin, who lived in that lonely spot all the year round, with only now and then an occasional guest for a weekend, came out to greet them. Usually his face beamed when he saw these young people, but today he looked greatly troubled. "'What's up, Mr. Wiggin?' Bob drew rein to inquire. "'You look as though you've seen a ghost.' "'Well, I come out to warn you, young people, you'd better turn back. "'Old man Bartlett, who lives a mile up the wood road, was robbed an hour ago. "'He'd been into town to get five hundred dollars he had in the bank. "'Got a queer notion that the bank was going to pieces. "'He had the money in an old bag. "'Someone must have seen him getting it out of the bank and followed him. "'Anyway, when he reached the wood road, he was held up and robbed. "'Well!' "'With all the unbroken snow there is about here, it will be easy enough to catch the thief,' Bob said. "'You're wrong there,' Mr. Wiggin replied. "'Several teams have been along the lake road since the blizzard, and he could walk in the ruts.' "'Was poor old Mr. Bartlett hurt?' Gertrude asked anxiously. "'No, not at all. He was blindfolded and tied to a tree, but he worked himself loose before long, but the robber was gone. The old man came right down here and we telephoned to the sheriff. He and his men will be along most any minute now.' There may be some shooting, so I would advise you boys to take the girls right back to town. Jack looked nervously at Mary, who was vigorously shaking her head. We aren't afraid, are we, girls? Not with all these boys along to protect us, Peg declared. Then Doris explained. We're only going as far as our cabin, Mr. Wiggin. That's not more than a mile from here. We'll be all right. That crook is probably headed to Dorchester by this time, one of the boys put in. We don't want to miss our fun for him. The innkeeper watched the sleigh load of young people until they had disappeared over a rise on the East Lake Road. Then he shook his head solemnly and, having entered the inn, he said to his wife, That's what I call a foolhardy risk. It might be all right for the young fellows if they were alone, but to take a parcel of girls into nobody knows what, I call it downright foolishness and maybe worse. Why, if they cornered that highwayman he would shoot, and of course there's no telling who he would hit. "'Well, not being their guardian, I couldn't prevent their going, and so they'll have to take their chance.' Meanwhile, the two big white horses were slowly ploughing their way along the east side of the lake. In some spots the road was quite bare, and where the wind had swept across the fields, but in other places the horses floundered through deep snow drifts. The road, which led close to the lake, was hilly and winding, and, as it neared the cabin, it entered a dense wood of snow-covered pines. "'Girls, why don't you blow on your horns?' Bob called as he looked back. There's nothing to be afraid of. That highwayman would make straight for Dorchester, where he could lose himself in the crowd. Suddenly, Mary called out excitedly, Bob, stop a minute. Look there. That highwayman must have been riding on a horse. If it was, this is where he turned and cut through the pine woods to the old Dorchester road. Jack and several other boys leaped over the side of the sleigh and followed the tracks for some distance through the woods, where there was little snow on the ground. Say, boys, I believe Mary's got the right idea. "'Jack said as he climbed back to his former place next to Geraldine. "'Glad we saw those tracks,' Alfred put in. "'Now we know for sure the highwayman won't be lurking around the Drexel cabin. "'Sure thing. Let's proceed to forget about him and have a good time,' Bob called in his cheerful way. "'Blow on your horns, girls. Make this silent pine wood ring. "'Ooh, isn't it silent, though? And dark, too. "'Hurry up, Bob. We'll blow hard enough when we get out into the sunshine,' "'Betty Bird said as she huddled close to Mary.' 
Peggy took occasion to say to Doris in a low aside that the boys of the CDC probably thought that they now had a mystery to solve, but they wanted the girls to think that they weren't interested. "'That's what I thought,' was the whispered reply. "'Wouldn't it be great if we solved the mystery first? "'Say, cut out the secret stuff,' one boy across them called. Then, taking his companion's horn, he blew a merry blast. The others did likewise, and so noisily they emerged into the sunshine— but some of the girls glanced back at the silent, sombre woods as though fearing that the robber had been there all of the time. Just in front of them, and built close to the lake, was a picturesque lob cabin. "'Hooray for the Drexel Lodge!' someone called. "'You girls stay in the sleigh,' Bob said, "'while we boys see if the robber is hiding in the cabin.' Five minutes later the lads reappeared. "'He certainly isn't there,' Jack declared. "'The heavy wooden doors and blinds are all padlocked just as they were left last fall.' and there is no other way of entering. So let's forget the highwayman and have a good time we planned. Jack is right, Bertha said, as she leapt from the sleigh. Doris, you have the key. Let's open the doors while the boys get wood from the shed. Isn't the ice just great? I can hardly wait to get my skates on. Can you, Geraldine? The young people were convinced that the highwayman was not in their neighbourhood, and, with fear gone, they resumed their merry-making. The blinds were opened, letting in a flood of sunlight. A big dry log was soon burning on the wide hearth, and the fire was started in the kitchen stove. Now, girls, Doris announced, I want you all to go skating with the boys while I prepare our supper. Why, won't you be afraid to stay here alone? Betty Bird, the timorous, inquired. I wouldn't do it for worlds. No, I'm not afraid, Doris replied. The house was locked, so why should I be? Sure thing, you're safe enough, Bob declared, but if you do get frightened, blow on your horn. Ten minutes later, Doris was alone, or at least she thought she was alone in the log cabin. End of chapter 12